with before our discussion today. Um, this concerns your culinary preferences for next week's lunch. Um, so we thought that we would uh, do a very informal survey uh, and ask who would prefer pizza, sandwiches, or surprise me. So let's, let's see it for pizza. Pizza is not getting a huge show. Okay, sandwiches. So, so far, sandwiches have it. Surprise me. Oh, that's a tough call between surprise me and sandwiches. I'd say 40, 20, 20. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so maybe we'll get sandwiches and then everyone else can have boar's head or something. Yeah. Uh, all right, so we, we're still working on the location of next week's uh, mixer, but you will be informed in due time. And it'll be at this, at this time, so at least just keep the, the lunch. Okay, so most likely the Alumni Center uh, or CEPR, which is in Encina, right? On Galvez, okay. Oh, right, so they're both on, both on, yeah, okay, so we'll, we'll send you an email with the exact um, details. So um, I'm really happy that uh, two eminent colleagues were able to join us for today's discussion of Tony Grafton's lecture. Um, to my far right, uh, David Lummis, uh, an assistant professor of Italian um, who just really rejoined Stanford uh, after we stole him away from Yale. Um, David works on primarily on Boccaccio, and as you may remember, Boccaccio was one of Petrarch's good friends and even wrote A Life of Boccaccio. Uh, and I'm also very happy that Paula Finland, uh, who is the Ubaldo Pierotti Professor of Italian History, uh, could join us. Paula works um, on a number of fields, notably the history of science, also on the Renaissance more broadly, um, and as her title suggests, she has a specific interest in Italy. Um, before I, I turn the floor over to David and Paula to sort of kick off our, our discussion today, I just wanted to underscore two points from last week's lecture that I think are of particular relevance to, to our course, uh, to your education, and hopefully to our discussion today. Um, the first point is kind of subtle, but I, I think it uh, underscores uh, just something very profound about how your, org your education at Stanford um, differs from uh, education at some other schools and, and from other times. Petrarch, uh, as you may remember, made a list of his preferred books or his libri particulari, uh, my particular books. This is interesting for a number of reasons. As, um, as Tony Grafton mentioned, they're mostly pagan books, so already that was a little... Jose at the time. Um, but more, more generally, I thought what was really interesting here is this notion that uh, there is not a fixed canon of books that everybody must read and admire uh, in equal measure, but that a liberal education is about figuring out what your own canon is, who your favorite authors are. Uh, this is something that comes back, uh, for those of you who've read uh, Montaigne on education, Montaigne talks about you know, how he really has a soft spot for Seneca and Cicero. Um, Rousseau, similarly, will talk about you know, his love of Plutarch and Livy. Um, it seems like finding out who your favorite authors are is one of the purposes of, of an education. And, and I, I mentioned this um, as, as being relevant to your education here because one of the discussions we had when we were um, contemplating undergraduate education at Stanford um, as a whole over the last two years was, well, do we want to have a kind of core curriculum that exists at some schools, notably Columbia and to a lesser extent at Chicago? Um, and a lot of the humanists were like, yay, core curriculum. Um, but we ended up not going that way. And, and I think what's uh, perhaps good about what we, um, what we have is, is this idea that, you know, there you should almost be responsible for putting together your own core curriculum, uh, and that that should be one of the, the, the goals of, of, your, of your education. Um, the second point I'll make briefly um, is, uh, is a very interesting way that um, Tony Grafton showed Petrarch building or modeling his life using bits and pieces of other people's lives. Um, and so this is really the focus of one of the seminars uh, that the, uh, Blair and Carolyn Hawksby are teaching, reading lives as a form of education. Um, and it's something that uh, I know that we've come across in our class when uh, both Montaigne and Rousseau say, you know, uh, the, almost 
the textbook of education should be Plutarch. Why? Because Plutarch writes about illustrious lives, and it is in reading about other people's lives that uh, you learn not only much about them, much about their period, but also about character, about um, how to make difficult choices, etc. cetera. Um, and, and this seems like a, an aspect of education that we, we don't really think about much anymore, um, while it is quite central. Uh, I think we all end up, to a greater or lesser extent, making important decisions based on decisions other people have made and modeling ourselves after others. This can be very good, like when you choose not to go to law school, um, <laughs> or it can be, uh, as, as Petrarch was saying, uh, uh, or, or it can be bad if you just follow somebody because you think they're cool and you're not really think, you're not really reflecting about it. And it seems like that's precisely uh, another area where um, liberal education um, maybe should be uh, going back to some of the earlier uh, principles of, of education, which is being a bit more self-conscious about these choices. I think we all have these kind of models that consciously or not we end up following uh, in, in critical moments, but maybe having a discussion about what does it mean, for instance, when our uh, university president uses the example of Steve Jobs' life in his convocation to you. Um, you know, so what does it mean to look up to somebody and to try to model ourselves after him? Um, how can we have the discussion about what, what are lives not just worth living, but lives worth imitating? So I just throw those two points out there and uh, will now cede the floor to David, who's going to talk a bit about the letter on posterity. The letter. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for inviting me to, to do this. Um, so in response to sort of to get us thinking about what Professor Grafton um, talked about uh, last week, um, I wanted to talk about two words um, that are important for Petrarch and to our understanding of Petrarch. One is freedom and one is authenticity. Um, I think that it, by focusing on his freedom as an individual, not only in the letter to posterity, but in many of his works, um, that we can understand the self-fashioning in the letter to posterity um, as authentic. Um, and by authenticity, I mean the degree to which a person is true to his or her own character and is self-conscious of the tensions between the external reality and inner being. Um, while we might consider him authentic, Petrarch wasn't really always the most sincere person, especially in the public arena. You probably noticed in the letter to posterity there were a lot of um, examples of false modesty, probably. Um, in fact, he often said one thing and did another. He criticized others for what he himself was doing, such as making money off of, off of, uh, off of his own eloquence. Uh, Professor Grafton mentioned that the laurel crowning in Rome uh, was more really an act of theater uh, than anything else. And even his list of books actually is a kind of uh, an example of his intellectual insincerity, but not necessarily in a bad way, because what he was doing, um, he listed a number of books that, um, that he has read among his favorite books. Um, and he says in a letter to Boccaccio, actually, that he's read these books many, many times and that they've become a part of who he is. And he says they're in his marrow. Um, but then there are, he lists a number of other books that he, to Boccaccio you know, that he says he's only really flipped through. And he only picked here and there a few nice little things. But that's actually not really the case. But what he was doing is he was, um, these books that he actually read but doesn't list, um, don't really have enough cultural capital to raise his status publicly. So you have an example of a kind of insincerity there. But he didn't do this gratuitously. Um, he really had a public project that sought to ground the ethical and spiritual, uh, his own ethical and spiritual inquiry on a newly combined canon of Christian and Roman authors. He wanted to combine Virgil, Livy, and Cicero um, with Augustine, Jerome, and St. Paul. Um, but he's very self-conscious that these ideas are out of sync with his time. So how can he be both authentic and insincere? <laughs> well, I think, to put it shortly, that this kind of ambiguity was at the foundation of Petrarch's sort of quest to understand himself. Um, Professor Grafton pointed out that Petrarch fashioned himself as an imperfect person, 
who didn't focus um, on his successes as much as on his failures and uncertainties. And this is especially true um, in the letter about the ascent of Mont Blanc II, which, which Professor Grafton mentioned. Um, you know, you know, he represents his own inability to bring about final change, unlike Augustine, um, whose confessions recount the discovery of himself in relation to God. Um, so while Augustine's conversion endows him with a new solid sense of the individual self within an eternal vision of history, Petrarch, in the letter to posterity and elsewhere, he really only cites God in relation to his freedom. God freed him, he says, or allowed him to be freed from his desire, and, he, and God allowed him to choose the straight path. So this is all from the, uh, from the perspective, from the standpoint of Petrarch as a post-60-year-old man, um, who sees his freedom to err in his youth um, and his choice, his eventual choice for the right path as a gift from God. Um, but his experience of himself and of history is really relegated to a morally ambiguous time-bound region. It's not this um, eternal sense of time. Um, in his letter to posterity and his, um, his poetry, I think Professor Grafton read 134, 132, um, the sonnet, yeah. Um, they're a kind of confession, you can think of it, or an acknowledgment of this, kind, of this ambiguity and it marks, this, this acknowledgement marks the authenticity of his broken narrative of himself. Um, so he's self-conscious of the fact that he's not whole, but he, even though he wants to be. And I think it's interesting in this regard to look at the structure of the letter. You know, in the first half, Petrarch gives a really beautiful, detailed portrait of himself physically and psychologically um, that arrives at his 60th year, or past his 60th year. Um, in the second half, uh, the letter recounts the historical events that make up his, make up his life, but only up until 1351, um, when he returns to his solitary retreat in southern France. And this is right before, by the way, he goes to Milan and um, uh, works in cahoots with uh, local tyrants there and made a lot of his friends angry, um, <laughs> who accused him of, being, of going against what he says, that he was a free man. So... Um, but the, the portrait in the first part really conditions the way we see the second part. Um, the Petrarch we know from the portrait is one who struggled to overcome himself and his times, a man with certain strengths and weaknesses, um, who tried to make himself anew, you know, to become free through an exertion of his will. Um, in the second half, we see the turns of the wheels of fortune and Petrarch's willful confrontation of them. Each episode ends abruptly and another begins anew. So here you see that, that they think that freedom and newness are bound together for Petrarch. The freedom always entails the possibility of starting anew, and novelty presupposes the state of freedom. So he wanted us to see the events in his life through the lens of the self-portrait as a kind of flawed but, me, but free man, kind of a mediocre person. Um, the, the portrait of his interior self conditions our reading of his historical life, even though um, insincere as some of those self-representations might be, his self-fashioning is authentic because by recognizing an interior moral ambiguity that is never able to reach the perfection of Augustine's conversion, he sort of lays the foundation for his own novel voice in history. I think the model that he leaves instructs that the public life of an intellectual in the theater of historical events should be accompanied by a profound introspection a kind of confession that does not lie uh, to oneself, even as it fashions the self for a public debut. So only by doing so, only by acknowledging this, can Petrarch set himself on the path of freedom, a freedom from the, the, the traps of inherited tradition. He can make his own canon, a freedom from political ideology. He can work for great men while at the same time maintaining a sense of uh, internal freedom, and a freedom from self-deception. Um, so his life is exemplary because it's not founded on grand ideals of moral and political completeness, but on the freedom to err and in erring to find himself. So that's, that's what I had to say, Dan. So. <laughs> All right. Um, let me start first by asking a question. How many people have gone and read the Wikipedia entry on, on Petrarch? All right. right. 
So those of you who've read already know this very fun fact at the bottom, and those of you who haven't will know this now, which is that in 2003, um, people dug up Petrarch's body. They took it out of the tomb in Arqua, and uh, they wanted to examine it to see just how tall Petrarch had actually been, had he been a really tall guy. Um, and of course, they could not resist, as happens with all famous minds, to examine the skull. As those of you who've read this know, it turned out that the skull in the tomb, the crushed remnants of it, was not Petrarch's. The body and the head did not match. Now, whether this puzzle will ever be resolved, you know, about why the, the cranium, the crushed bits of cranium inside this tomb in Arqua are not Petrarch, I can't say. But what I certainly can say is the fact that as late as 2003, people are doing this as part of celebrating the anniversary of a very dead and very great man is a sign of the way in which we speak across the centuries, right, to different kinds of people. And I think that this is certainly one of the points that my dear friend and colleague Tony Grafton wanted to make to you when he came all the way from the East Coast, you know, last week um, to talk with you about his Petrarch and the role of his Petrarch and why he's a historian of the Renaissance, as I also am. I want to focus for a few minutes on the early side of Petrarch's letter and the kinds of things it embodied. And to talk with you a little bit about how historians think about this kind of material, because historians tend to read texts from the outside, you know, looking in, right? We don't start on the inside, we arrive there, and then we bring it back into the outside, because the goal for somebody like me, much more than my colleague David, is to sort of understand Petrarch as an expression of a world, right? Of what made that world and moment interesting. And constantly balancing these two kinds of readings is the pleasure, right, of what, what it means for someone like me to study the past. You know, so what is this world that we see when we read Petrarch's letter? We see a world of exile, right? We see a world of exile and anxiety. You know, as Ben has repeatedly said, right, in all of the readings, you know, that different people have offered you across these two weeks. We see a world of people who have succeeded to a certain degree and yet are constantly aware that it could be taken away from them. This was the world of 14th century Florence and many of the Italian city-states. Exile was not just a literary theme, it was the common human condition, especially for anyone who had any kind of standing, right? So, being, being and not being somewhere is something that preoccupies not just Petrarch, but everybody. His restlessness is the restlessness of this entire world. But there's not just this kind of political restlessness and unsettled nature, right, of who really runs things and whether you're in or out. But there also is the kind of restlessness of what it all means. What does it mean to spend seven years studying law in two of the greatest universities in an era in which the university is still a fresh and novel institution? Bologna is still reputed today, I've lived there for many years, to be technically the oldest university in the world as far as we can document Western universities. Um, Padua, not that far behind, both of them made their reputation on the faculties of law as they evolved, right? So to go and to study law in these places was to do one of the important learned activities that also was a professional path to success in this society in many, many different ways. And yet we see Petrarch in various ways just riddled with anxieties about this sure path to success. His father is a lawyer. His brother is studying law. Well, we see what happens with both of them, right? I mean, neither of them become lawyers, you know, proof positive that sometimes family genealogies take a different turn. Um, and he says at one point, in one of these many self-reflections that he offers, why he, had, why he had considered these seven years an utter waste of his mind and his time. He said, I couldn't face making a merchandise of my mind, right? You know, this is a phrase I've always liked because it's exactly what he does, right? <laughs> I didn't want to sell my mind this way. I freed it from this, right? I freed it from the tried and true path into this profession increasingly central to the society, not only to the church, but to the state, right? To be a man of learning like that opens so many doors. To have that kind of literacy and education was a guarantee to many different kinds of jobs in the society. You know, and yet, Petrarch wants neither those professional opportunities, at least not in that way, right? Not in that way nor does he want the content of that learning, right, of this 
medieval scholastic learning, working your way through Justinian's digest and all of the other ancient Roman texts of law. This is not what he wants. He wants to make his own list. And in doing so, of course, he makes a list for us, he makes a list for his own time, and he ultimately becomes the list. And that's why we have him in front of us today, right? This is his brilliance, right? In going through this process of the list making and the list creating. Petrarch's society was on the verge of trying to decide what it wanted to be. And at least if you talk to someone like Petrarch, it was not what its present embodied, right? There were too many things in his mind that were wrong with that present. The church was not in Rome. His higher, entire life is all about the fact that the church is not in Rome, right? This guides most of his travel back and forth and back and forth between Italy and Avignon and many of the French towns nearby, constantly wondering whether any particular pope and the current political situation in the moment will finally draw it all back to where it ought to be, bringing the center of the faith of his world to the ancient center of the learning from which he is making his list. So this is one of the things that Petrarch is trying to constantly figure out as he wanders all over places. He wanders through the monasteries, largely in France, right, or in northern Italy, far away from Rome, finding Cicero's letters in 1345, and a myriad of other discoveries that will produce some of his other famous letters that you haven't read in this class, but you've heard about certainly from Tony Grafton, right, the letters where he writes to Cicero and Virgil and says, especially to Cicero, I'm disappointed in you now that I know you better. Right? That's his fundamental message to Cicero. <laughs> Virgil, you know, perhaps less disappointment, but still always, you know, I mean, what you see is Petrarch's sense of his own self constantly emerging, not only in his admiration, but in his disappointment, right? In the ancients, as much as in his contemporaries, none of them are sufficient, and this is why he has to make himself. This is why he has to make that extra move. But he can never be that self without being the kind of person who quintessentially emerges from this world, the Renaissance humanist. Right? Petrarch has often been presented, as he is on the Wikipedia website, as one of the fathers of humanism, perhaps the father of humanism, of a new way of thinking about learning, of a, a kind of vocabulary and structure of learning that we still think of today as being part of the origins of what we call the humanities, certainly not the whole, and this is not in the set of informal remarks. What I don't want to do is give you a lecture on that subject, but you know, if you're interested, look up humanism on another Wikipedia site and you'll see the whole discussion, you know, or in many other places or talk, ask people about it in your discussion sections if you're thinking about the origins of a kind of humanistic knowledge, right, and what the point is. But, but Petrarch, in becoming this kind of person who will be called a humanist retrospectively, um, does indeed make something new from his world that can only be made as long as he keeps the books on the shelf and adds to them, right? In the later periods of his life, one of the many things Petrarch has anxieties about that I've always loved is that he's loved his books too much, not just in his mind, but as physical objects. This goes back to one of the points I think that Grafton talks about, right? That he's not like Augustine, right? He can't, he not only can't entirely deny his bodily self, you know, sex, the reality of things. He can't, he, he succeeds at times, he fails at other times, he's constantly thinking about this. He can never fully become like Augustine, but he also can't, entirely renounce the corporeal desire of the pleasure of knowledge that for him is represented by those books on that shelf, by the painting that he owns by Giotto that he talks about anxiously even in his will that he writes a few years before his death, um, in the amount of money that he wants to give his friend Boccaccio, 50 florins for a dressing gown, right? Another famous mo quote from that famous will. And so on through you know, this, this whole itinerary in which he's constantly saying to himself, you know, I, I cannot be this kind of person only inside myself. I can only be this kind of person as I surround and create an environment that reassures me that what I have become is what I should be. And in doing so, the reassurance, of course, ultimately comes from the outside, that the, his society has valued and praised what he has done, which allows him to be humble, to be anxious, to feel dissatisfied because he can always rest secure that in the end, Robert of Anjou in Naples really likes him, was ready to crown him poet laureate in Naples, and it's Petrarch who says, I need to do this in Rome on the steps of the Capitol, right? He wants the symbolic moment.
But he never forgets that Robert of Anjou, this great patron and politician, really, really likes him. He, t he takes that seal of approval with him even as he leaves Italy and, of course, for the umpteenth time, goes back to France, even as he goes to a different world, right? And again, this collecting of all of the men of politics that we see throughout even a single letter is so characteristic of Petrarch, so characteristic of, of this age, you know, that, that it, it's a world, I mean, it's hard for us to sort of think back, and maybe one of the nicest ways to put this would be something like this. Um, you're working on becoming a best-selling author, but so far you've only become famous in the state of Tennessee. How many other states do you need to visit before you really have become famous and will get into the top 10 list on Amazon? Right? Petrarch is working on visiting all 50 states. <laughs> And what I mean by that, of course, is the patchwork of politics, of political entities that made up what we think of nowadays as Italy. As some of you may know, Italy is not a nation until the middle of the 19th century. Some would say it's only an anxious nation, an incomplete one, <laughs> even today. Uh, but that's, of course, for another story that has nothing to do with Petrarch and a lot to do with Italy. Um, and, um, and, and, but what it certainly was in this period was a very complex and multivalent set of adjoining political entities whose boundaries were constantly shifting as much as the papacy was you know, wildly you know, shifting also between whether it would be in Rome or whether it would be in France. Um, so part of Petrarch's success, I think, is in having mastered that world and put himself in it over and over again. So one patron dies. That's, you know, the advantage is that you can move on. You, know, you can move on, right? There isn't only one patron, and he understood that and used that over and over again as he sold what he called the merchandise of my mind. This might be a good place to stop. I certainly can say more, but I, I know that what we really want to do today is, is talk. But I have one coda, actually, that has nothing to do with Petrarch. You'll all remember the moment in Tony Grafton's lecture where he talks about the historian who write vamp writes vampire novels. One of my former students. <laughs> she teaches at the University of Southern California. You can buy the books in the Stanford Bookstore if you want to read them. <laughs> Deborah Harkness. Deborah Harkness, a great person and a good friend. <laughs> all right, well, thanks very much. We'll do the same system as uh, last week, so um, I guess Beth and I will be on in the wings. Just raise your hand um, to ask a question, and questions can be about the lecture, can be about... I did warn Paula and David that you asked biographical questions about Tony, so they're ready. Um, and why don't we start up in the back? Um, the microphone is arriving. Could you just wait? We actually need you to speak in the ah, mic for yeah. the recording. Sorry. Was Petrarch the, the first person to write about his imperfections and his uh, limitations, or no? Or why is he famous for that, I guess? Why is he famous? Well, he's not, I guess, the first really to do any of the things that he does. He's the first person, I think, who really combines all of these aspects into one single kind of project. And I think that to think of it as a project is important because you know, there were humanists, the generation before him, who wrote you know, an, autobiogra an autobiography, but they didn't insert it into a cultural program in the same way that he did. And that's, he, he sort of you know, makes himself this, this project. I don't know if you have. Yeah, I think that's right. It's not, it's not that he does it, it's how. Yeah. It's how he does it. Um, in a way that then resonates, you know, for future generations, the way that Augustine had resonated for him, right. mm -hmm. or Dante, for that matter. Mm -hmm. okay. Do you think that acknowledgement of his errors that you mentioned is enough to be, for him to be considered a public intellectual? Well, I think his his career makes him into a public intellectual. I mean, he works, and you know, he's always visiting courts trying to convince. Yeah, he, he works on trying to unite at a certain point um, you know, the Eastern and Western churches to bring the, the, uh, the, the papacy back to Rome. He does all of these things in the public arena. But what makes him, um, what makes it interesting to me like the, what, is the internal sort of anguish that he feels because he, ha he, he feels a great sense of insecurity like, like um, Paula was saying about you know, the rest of the age. They're kind of they don't have a ground to stand on, and he's trying to make a ground at the same time as he realizes that it's not really there. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. yeah. 
Yeah, he's a working mind, you know, mm -hmm. he really is, in a literal sense, right? And I mean, there's no underestimating how he transforms his literary, you know, talents into uh, diplomacy. Mm -hmm. You know, even though it's not always successful diplomacy, this is an example of an emerging occupation. Many people have argued, historians have argued that, 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 that in many ways certain ingredients of the origins of diplomacy are, are created in Renaissance Italy. I mean, that's a very, you know, one could have an argument about how true that is, but I think it's true enough in the sense that this is one of the places that creates this kind of political role. Not fully established in Petrarch's time, really going to be much more formally established as a job by the late 15th and certainly the 16th century. So he's already in a kind of slipstream of what to do with a working mind, mm -hmm. you know, and this is, uh, this is something that, you know, he, he, he reflects less on. I think it's more something that just comes through, mm -hmm. you know, in the way he talks about politics always intruding in his reflections on himself. Right. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, so it sounds like the more and more we learn about Petrarch, the more we see that he's really insecure, as you were saying. He's just he's full of anguish and he's not really sure of himself. And he looks to others externally to derive his own, almost his own self-worth. and. To me, that seems like a weakness, but I, I'm not sure. Should we be looking to others to define our own self-worth and uh, our intellectual vitality, or should there be something more internal, more genuine, I guess, that defines who we are as academics? Good question, wow. Um, well, I don't know if he defines his own self-worth with others, but I think what he's doing is trying to insert himself into the world in a meaningful way, and he can only do that through contact with others. And um, so he has a purpose that he feels that he has a purpose and he can't accomplish that on his own. And so he needs people like the Colonna family or the Visconti in Milan or the, um, the Carrara in Padua to enact his, like, the ideas that he has in his mind. And the insecurities that he, feel, he feels, I think, make um, his public persona um, all that more credible because he doesn't pretend like he does have all the answers, at least on the inside. While on the outside, he may be making real world decisions, he still has a profound introspection that, that, um, that reveals the complexity of his person in, in the political realm or, or in, um, just in, within these huge historical events in which he inserts himself. And he can only do that by, by companioning, like by going together, by combining himself with powerful individuals. That makes sense. You know, when I was an undergrad sitting in exactly where all of you are sitting, listening to, say, a lecture you know, on Renaissance Italy and humanism, one of the great subjects people always talked about was how this era produces this great debate between the active and the contemplative life. You know, what they call the vita activa, the vita contemplativa, right? There's, there's a massive literature on this, less read nowadays, but I think quite relevant to your questions. That, that this is a society that's actively debating the value of these different positions, recognizing that uh, you know, it's not a debate that's going to be resolved, but that it's productive in positioning yourself and in addressing different kinds of problems in the world. I mean, so, you know, we see Petrarch being very clever about that because he recognizes the value of both. Um, he's definitely not, not somebody who, you know, is going to retreat from the world fully for all sorts of reasons, including needing that sort of external validation. I mean, I think he does, he clearly cares about that, right? He's not, you know, he's not somebody who literally will retreat into the crystalline purity of his mind. And <laughs> I'm now thinking a little bit of Descartes, who of course actually also doesn't really retreat from society because he does this in the middle of the world's most prosperous commercial society. The 17th century Netherlands is his retreat, right, from, you know, from his friends. And, um, uh, you know, think of somebody like Isaac Newton, who also famously seems so contemplative and yet is going to become master of the mint, right? Coins, money, the economy, the bustling British world is all around him. So even when people say they retreat, I'm a little skeptical. Mm -hmm. You know, let me put it that way. But, but to, to take the other side of your question, too, about is it a failure, right, to do, you know, I mean, I think, to answer it now, not, you know, with him, but generally, I think I think we should all be inspired by the things around us. Rather, in other words, each of us peaks, picks up something as one does in a poetic chainto, where you sort of take one piece and then another piece and then another piece, you know. And you may not even know that you're doing it, and you may not know what you're going to do with it, 
But if it's interesting, lock it away somewhere back in your brain. Who knows when it might be useful, right? So I, I, I'm, um, I, I'm, I'm of the mind you know, that all of our originality, in a way, comes from our experience of the world. And probably that's the best way to really answer you know, the question. Um, and that's a debate that I might have with a philosopher who might make a different argument about that. You know, but that, that is a sign, of course, of probably why I became a historian. I can never, I can never completely lose the world. <laughs> Excuse me, Linear, for saying that. <laughs> um, you talked about, um, sorry, you talked about the uh, sincerity and the insincerity of Petrarch, and I'm just wondering how much do you think that insincerity, that false humility that he uses in his letter to posterity, um, is just a product of his times and the writing style that he grew up learning how to use, uh -huh. and and if and if not how that affected his freedom. Hmm. How much of a part of it, it was just a, it was a rhetoric, it was a part of the way you represented yourself. I th well, uh, Professor Grafton did talk a little bit about you know, the way in which people represented themselves in these books of Ricordanza. And you know, it was more a, a, a narrative of what they learned and, and what they were going to impart. And you know, Petrarch doesn't really do that, so I think it's kind of, it is sort of original that he represents himself not really as a hero, but as everyone else. And he's, he's, you know, he humbles himself. And I think that the humbling is, you know, is a rhetorical device in order to get us into his, to his life, into that kind of um, quagmire, quagmire of you know, who am I and <laughs> how can I make choices in the world if I am not free, right? If I, if I don't have a direction, right? He doesn't have all the answers, right? Um, so um, I don't know, if, does that answer your question a little bit? I don't, and I don't think it's necessarily a product of his science. I think he, he may be using rhetorical tropes um, from various different genres. So do you think humility is sincere? <laughs> <laughs> um, good question. No, I don't, actually. Um, <laughs> but from my, I mean, I think that, um, he was a complex individual, you know, and I think it, it doesn't. If it's insincere, it doesn't mean it's not real. You know what I mean? That you can have multiple selves, right? And you can recognize shortcomings at the same time mm -hmm. as you enact a kind of confident self, right? So I think he's showing us one version of himself. Yeah, I think <laughs> any of you who've ever won a prize will know that the best way to accept it is to be humble, mm -hmm. right? And so he's expressing that over and over again. Of course, he's also creating some of his own prizes, and that makes him a little different than the rest of us who won the high school French award or whatever we won, <laughs> you know, National Merit Scholar. <laughs> so. right. so you both seem to stress um, this idea that Petrarch had a very large public intellectual persona, but in both the letter to posterity and in Anthony Grafton's speech, uh, Petrarch is portrayed as a character who definitely needs isolation for his creative expression and for all of his work. And for me, that's somewhat hard to reconcile the two personas. So uh, I guess part one of my question would be, how did his creative process influence the public perception of him? And uh, part B would be, uh, with which kind of persona would Petrarch more identify himself with? The public intellectual reconciling of both sides of the church, doing these works, or with and kind of seclude himself into the room or into the into nature and you know, kind of bang out all of his impressive works. You wanna go first or oh. we keep doing it that way, all just right. the way we started but yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. Um, you know that's a that's a wonderful question. Mm -hmm. And I mean obviously he cannot produce his literary corpus without that retreat. Right, I mean, he needs, you know, think of the story of Africa, you know, th this vast epic, you know, am I ever going to get it done? Oh, finally, I've gotten it, you know, I mean, this, this is all about the Vaucluse, right? You know, and Arqua, these are these places for him, you know, to, to be outside of Avignon, to be outside of, you know, to not be in the hustle and bustle of whatever the local major city is. So, I mean, I think like any of us would say, there, 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 you know, there, there's an aspect of your creativity in which you have to at least temporarily shut other things down, otherwise, you don't get that kind of intense focus, you know, that any of us who try to do something creative, 
need, you know, to see it through, right? Or to even imagine what it might be at the beginning or the middle. And I think that, that if, you, if you get interested in Petrarch to read more of him, you'll see that. I mean, you'll see that aspect of him too. Um, but then, I, you know, I, I don't know, David, what you think about this sort of prefer, does he, does he prefer that to, to the public intellectual, that, you know, diplomat, poet, traveler, you know, uh, the 14th century jet setter that he is, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and loves being, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know, I don't know, because one of, one of my favorite moments of Petrarch is the letter he writes, you know, of his first and enduring vision of Rome, and he's clearly out of his contemplative life, and yet he's encountering it out there in the world. He's seeing the actual, think of this in this letter, he talks about his desire to go to Rome, and that is a desire to see the actual physical ruins of a city that once housed a million people and has at best about 40,000 people and more livestock in the Colosseum than human remnants or traces of that great antiquity. But he has to go out and, you know, that cannot be contemplative. He has to travel. The travel is incredibly difficult. The only reason he can travel so well is because he's constantly being guarded by the Colonna family <laughs> everywhere he goes, right? That's the only reason he can even enter this very difficult, awful place known as mid-14th century Rome with no papacy in sight. This, this scene, you know, is, you know, not as bad as the sites of some recent awful wars, but it's not pretty, you mm -hmm. know. It has a lot of the same ingredients, so there is an enormous risk and danger to have done that, and yet it is so important as part of the, the, the armor, you know, the intellectual armor he needs to get back to the study, whether it's in the Vaucluse or Arqua, and do his thing. So I'm, I, I, I still, I, for me, I always argue for the connection. Can I just actually uh, yeah. follow up with a question that we got on the on the wiki okay. um, from one of the uh, one of the students who was enrolled in the the SIS version? Um, and so I not, I don't have the name here, but if you if you recognize the question, you can raise your hand. Uh, and this had to do with the the connection between writing and and self fashioning. Um, so some of us have read Montaigne, where he talks about how it's through writing that I discover myself, and that. Mm -hmm. um, that is the very process of self-fashioning. Whereas, um, so what, or rather, what is the, the role of writing for Petrarch? Is there a similar sense that so when he is retreated in the Vaucluse in his study, is that a moment of self-discovery? Or is that just a moment where, you know, finally I can write down all my brilliant ideas I had, um, you know, while watching cows graze in the Colosseum? That's a good question. I mean, because there's... Do you want to claim the question? <laughs> Okay. Oh, two. two people, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it's a multi-question. <laughs> yeah. But I guess there's, there's numerous kinds of writing that, that Petrarch has. I mean, he takes on different persona. Uh, whenever he, uh, he writes his lyric poetry, uh, he's very, very intimate. Um, he lets you into his secret world. The same thing, he writes a, he writes a kind of an imaginary dialogue between a Franciscus and an Augustinus, and you know, it's called My Secret Book. And so you, you get a kind of interior yeah. self-reflection. You know, self secretum, yeah. Right, the secretum. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, but he writes invectives on the other hand, and he really takes on the persona of a lawyer, right? And he is attacking people's, other people's selves, and he's trying to denigrate them and what have you. A physician, he famously attacks a physician for having criticized um, poetry. And, um, so yeah, I think he's constantly using writing as self fashion. When he writes the the Divita Solitaria, like on the solitary life, he, you know, he's trying to, um, to to find a kind of tradition in which he can est establish his own um, kind of creative process, I suppose. Um, but there's always a tension, I guess, in between in, in between these various personas. Like there was a tension between the active and contemplative life. You know, should he be a public intellectual? How do you, how am I best a public intellectual? You know, how am I best, you know, how can I best insert myself into this, you know, into these historical events and make a difference? So, yeah, I think writing is a kind of self-fashioning. It's just, mm -hmm. there are so many versions of himself that, you know, you, you can't really say, I'm making a single idea of myself.
Yeah, he's constantly reinventing yeah. writing. That is actually one of his great legacies. I mean, he's a writer in so many registers. I mean, we, we, that's not something we say of many people, actually. You know, some people, yes. I, I mean, he's not the only one we would say that of. But, but uh, you know, it, it is, uh, for somebody this early on also, to be able to say that about that also, again, I mean, to see, you know, I, I would have to stop and think about whether I would bring in any other points of comparison as far as that kind of writer's versatility, you know, this early, at least in my, you know, data bank of the, the writers I like to read and study from the past. Um, so that's, yeah, that's, 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 that's another piece of this, you know, of, of, of this puzzle about what he's, you know, what he's up to. What do, you, what, what do you really get when you're in the study and just how quiet, how isolated really is this as opposed to how he presents it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm always, much like Montaigne's, right? Montaigne's library sounds like this fabulous, you know, tower of books, right, you know? <laughs> and, 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 and yet there's a whole world coming to his doorstep and, you know, walking up the steps and, you know, and he's walking out. And, and so uh, if the world comes to your doorstep, are you really in retreat? Right. <laughs> I don't think so. Right. And he's constantly <laughs> criticized by his friends for this kind of discrepancy between, you know, am I in retreat or am I actually working for these people and, and you know, working for, say, the, the, the tyrants of Milan? And you know, Boccaccio calls him out on it and says, look, you know, <laughs> this doesn't match up with the idea you're giving everybody else of yourself in solitary retreat when you're actually mm -hmm. working for this regime, I guess. So <laughs> You just mentioned his friends, and that's actually what my question is about. Um, we've talked a lot about um, the, you know, how he's influenced by the ancients and how he was patronized by some of his contemporaries. But was he influenced by any contemporary artists or contemporary writers? Um, and if so, like, what do those influences do? I guess. The influences? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or friends. But you, you, of course, can offer a lot okay. about Boccaccio, um, but right? Boccaccio, you know, right. That, speaking of one of the most important of the friends. <laughs> no, I think, you know, I mean, he, yeah. meets, he meets Boccaccio in 1350, um, and as he's going to Rome and coming back, and um, they, they strike up a kind of conflicted friendship uh, where they disagree and, uh, and sort of go together on a number of different things. He never admits that he's ever influenced by his contemporaries. As you notice in the letter, he says, this is not my age. I'm born in the wrong time, <laughs> you know, and, um, and he, but he is actually, you know, he is in dialogue with a number of different individuals you know, across the Italic Peninsula, and um, Boccaccio is, you know, prime among them. They disagree. They, they're they're constantly, you know, I found they, they're exchanging their discoveries, you know, I uh, and their friendship is born over. Um, the, Boccaccio sends him a copy of, um, I believe it's Augustine's commentary on the Psalms. And um, so, you know, it's, they're sharing this. And um, so he can't help but be influenced by them. But he never admits it because it's not really a part of the, the kind of image of himself that he wants to present. Um, Dante is another person that mm -hmm. he is profoundly influenced mm -hmm. by. But he never mentions Dante's name, as far as I know. I mean, he talks about the Divine Comedy and says, hey, I read it when I was young, but you know, I haven't really looked at it again. And you know, he never mentions Dante's name. And I think it, there you have, between Boccaccio and, and Dante and Petrarch, a, a, a disagreement about the role of the poet in society, what language they should write in. Um, so the vernacular or Latin. Um, what is the vernacular good for? For Petrarch, it was the language of the, of the self. And um, you know, for, for Bogaccio and Dante, it was the language of the marketplace. And that was where you could make a difference. For Petrarch, the marketplace was not where you could make a difference. So, yeah. I, I wanted to ask a follow-up question to Kay's question. Um, you might say that uh, Petrarch exhibits an anxiety of influence when he doesn't say, I'm influenced by Boccaccio, or I'm influenced by Dante, or I'm influenced by many of the other early Renaissance intellectuals with whom he was in contact. He, does, he clearly doesn't feel anxious about thanking his patrons, who are political patrons, more or less, because they're all nicely thanked. Uh -huh. But he, he does, And he thanks ancient authors about right. whom he might feel less anxiety because they're so far in the past. But he doesn't like to thank his contemporaries. And it, it, in our class, we've been reading uh, Marcus Aurelius's meditations, which start with a long 
meditation where he thanks every person who influenced him in his life. And I think it's very striking, the difference, whether, do we think this is an error for Petrarch, that he, he can't reflect on himself and thank other people for things, or that this was necessary because he, he needs to create himself in a way that no emperor needs to create himself. Emperors you know, are born to the purple. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is uh, humanist, friendship is actually absolutely essential to Renaissance humanism. They talk about it all the time, they think about it intensely, they have these networks, as David was talking about, you know, in which you're trading books and manuscripts and, you know, your own, each other's, the writings of the ancients, etc. And, and so there, there, there are a lot of later humanists who spend a lot of time thanking their friends, you know? I, I mean, so you don't have to be an emperor to want to acknowledge, you know, your entire Facebook page, Renaissance style. <laughs> I, I actually, at an early point in my career, I spent a lot of time looking at Renaissance patronage, and it's a whole elaborate protocol, you know, that of, of, of how one does this and the different ways one talks about the nature of what friendship means. I mean, there's a whole literature on what, what friendship means, actually, as a result. Um, so this goes back to this idea that for Petrarch, it's a very deliberate choice, you know. And I wanted to sort of add in that back to this, this anecdote about, you know, his talking about the Giotto that he owns. He can appreciate Giotto because it's an act of connoisseurship. It further presents him. Giotto poses no threat, right? That, I mean, there is, there's no anxiety of influence because it's part of the, you know, creation of an environment. You know, of course, you know, I as a kind of great, you know, you know, aesthete, right, you know, can understand the quality of the new art that's emerging from Tuscany in the 14th century, you know, and here's, here's my talisman, you know, there, that's, 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 so he can do that. I mean, I, I was struck by that, and I think he can do that so readily and, and, and can't talk about Dante. You cannot <laughs> talk about Dante. But, but, but finally, you know, to, to sort of add another piece of this is that in the 15th century, over and over again, people are going to describe Dante, Petrarch, and Boccaccio as the three crowns of Renaissance Florence, right. you know, to quote a famous book that uh, translations of these texts. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I guess uh, I have two questions, uh, and they kind of pertain to what uh, Professor Anthony Grafton mentioned uh, last week. Um, he spoke of the situation where Petrarch uh, made the concession that this contemplative life did not always work for him, that he had this need to be famous. Um, and a modern, like an ancient, he said, uh, can write to be read by people unknown to him in the far future. Um, do you believe that it is in the nature of these individuals uh, who live in tension between vita contemplativa and vita activa uh, to strive to build themselves to be remembered by history. And by, the similar, by a similar token, um, Dr. Grafton spoke about an ethics and dynamics of reading, of reading as an art, and the poet who makes himself by reading, uh, reading what he wants. Um, but is there a certain selfishness in publishing annotated versions or choosing one's own canon with the type of authority that Petrarch had because it has the potential to cultivate complacency in readers, readers who would just be subordinate to that canon and not try to make their own. Oh, great question. Yes, very complex. Um, so it was in, in the, you asked if it was in the nature of these, of these folks to sort of look past their own time. So that's, that's right, yeah. And well, I think that a lot of great intellectuals are very untimely. You know, they see what's wrong with their, with their world and they want to fix it, but they also realize that that, that is an impossible task, or at least kind of you know, one that can't be finished um, in one's lifetime. So you, they're, I think, brought to kind of project themselves into the future um, so that someone else can take over the project whenever you know, that person passes away. Um, and then, you know, I guess making, I don't know, did you want to add? Oh, no, to that? Why don't you finish oh, and then up I guess the, the, making, the making yourself through, through reading, is that selfish, right? But, or is it kind of, is it dangerous? Is he sort of set, just setting up a new canon? Is that, that's your question? Is he setting up a new canon and kind of making a new tradition? Well, yeah, to a certain extent. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, whenever he writes the lives of great men, he writes this sort of compilation of biographies. Um, uh, he says, you should be grateful to me because I've taken out all of the inconsistencies, all these crazy pagan beliefs and everything. I've kind of cleaned up these people's lives 
to, and I'm going to represent them to you. So he's kind of enacting a synthesis. He's making himself a mediator between his readers and these texts that he's trying to repropose, right? And is that, is there something wrong with that? Um, or is this, is this dangerous for the future? I, mean, I don't really think so, because you know, there are two ways to read that. You, know, you can be kind of like Petrarch and do the same thing, or you can be kind of a passive reader of Petrarch, right? Mm -hmm. So you can either read like Petrarch very actively and creatively, or you can read Petrarch. And that's it, <laughs> right? So, right. Yeah. That's, well, that's a good jumping off point for me to add you know, to the answer. I, I, I think one of, Petrarch's success in overcoming that possibility you've alluded to is that he seeds intellectual desire. He seeds intellectual desire in his readers, yeah. in successive generations. In other words, projects that he has just initiated. Here's a good example. He has a Greek manuscript. He can't read Greek. This is one of his great self-confessed failings, right? That he cannot read one of the two great languages of the antiquity he craves. He has the object, he cannot unlock this. Because in the subsequent generations, Greek studies, there will be literally, no pun intended, a renaissance of Greek studies. This will happen partly for political reasons as Greek refugees flee um, the Eastern Adriatic with uh, the fall of Constantinople or the rise of Istanbul, depending on how you want to tell that story in 1453. Um, and, and Greek studies will become institutionalized. It will be part of the new excitement of education in and outside of the universities, starting in the Italian peninsula, right? So Petrarch's immediate heirs want to read Greek. And times change, and they collect more manuscripts. He seeds that desire to go out and discover this stuff, to do the, that he has found this much, and the restlessness of the next generation finds more and more. And that's why nowadays we have penguin paperbacks of all sorts of texts that many of us read in classes like this that are only available ad fonte, right at the starting point, as Tony Grafton would also say, because in the 15th century, people began to edit and translate these things and create definitive editions that are the genealogy of a modern English translation you know, that we can all use with pleasure, while also being reminded, as Tony said, that you never quite captured in that way, and you should just abandon the class and go study Latin, <laughs> or Hebrew, or whatever the language of choice is, right? If you're really into it, go for it. <laughs> This is the Petrarch I love, mm -hmm. right? That he does that, that, he's, that he creates that desire. Yeah. So, uh, um, Grafton was talking a bit about the culture of Florence and how that really um, affect, was affected by Petrarch and affected Petrarch with the birth of humanism and, humanism and everything. And I know Boccaccio is really influential in that area as well. I wondered if you could talk a bit about how the culture of Florence has really shaped and shaped Petrarch. Okay. You wanna go for that? I mean. Well, there are a lot of different ways to talk about that culture of Florence. Um, and so I'm not even sure where to start, but I'll throw out a few, you know, few things. Um, so if we look forward from this Florence, I mean, th this, this is a Florence that's going through one political experiment after another and all sorts of social struggle, right? So that's, that is part of the Florence that is captured, for instance, more in the writings of Boccaccio mm -hmm. and Dante to go back to what David's point about the writers who really emphasize their immediate texture of their world and write about it in a vernacular. Um, Boccaccio will write about the, the, the commercial miracle of late medieval Florence that creates the wealth, that will create the buildings. If you do Stanford's overseas studies program in Florence, you know, you will, if you've ever been to Florence for your own reasons at some point, you know, prior to this point in time, you know, you can go and see all these Renaissance palaces, all the art that fills them. I mean, the, the texture of the cultural byproducts of that economic miracle um, that was the medieval Mediterranean that placed cities like Florence and Pisa and Lucca and so forth, many of the cities of Tuscany in the center, would produce the quintessential figure of this period that so preoccupied Boccaccio, the Florentine merchant, mm -hmm. everywhere and anywhere in the world, you know, in Naples, in London, 
in Liege, in Bruges, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> halfway across, you know, anywhere that they could go, you could find these guys. But what's, what, what, what Petrarch doesn't want to talk about, what he, we, we won't see he misses it, he doesn't misses it, he evades it. What, and what Boccaccio captures, and Dante, I think, to a lesser degree, in a more complex and architectural way, right, is he, he captures that texture of a, a, a world that's, maybe in religious and political chaos, but economically is thriving. Yeah. So that's, that's actually one, I'll stop there because yeah. you want to throw in some other things. That's one thing I think of to answer your question yeah. about what is this world of 14th century Florence. Yeah, and yeah. You know, Petrarch never really called himself a Florentine. No. You know, I mean, he calls himself, he's, I was born in Arezzo, with, you know, my family was in exile. So I think Florence is always the place that defines him by negation almost, right? He's kind of, he's trying to differentiate himself from that world, even though he is a product of, of this sort of mercantile society, of this, you know, the fate of the aristocrat <laughs> in a mercantile uh, society. And, um, you know, a lot of these trade routes and, and you know, the, con the connectivity of the world was made possible precisely because of, you know, this sort of affluence. Um, but you know he becomes Florentine after he dies. You know Boccaccio is one of the first people to actually call him a Florentine poet, uh, <laughs> and he wants he wants to bring him back to Florence desperately. You know Petrarch won't come. Okay, <laughs> Petrarch. You know he offers him this you know a professorship. He says you would you would be a professor at the University of Florence and we'll pay you, and um, Petrarch says no, and Boccaccio is incredibly angry about it. And, Immediately after that, he goes to Milan, which is Florence's you know, historical enemy. <laughs> and so you, you have, you know, it's, it, so Florence sort of defines him to a certain extent, you know, um, but he's always trying to differentiate himself from a certain kind of culture that, that Boccaccio really represents in his literature, and Dante to a certain extent, too, depending on how you read Dante, yeah. Um, I feel like this is sort of a question this lecture and last lecture we've kind of generally been talking about, but I want to kind of ask it more specifically. Um, a, what you think uh, if there are the discrepancies, if any, between um, Petrarch's intent in recording his self-fashioning and, and what we're trying to get out of it, mm -hmm. and B, what you think the implications are for him and, and for us. Okay. So the, the discrepancies between what he what he was trying to do and what we're getting out of what he's left us. Mm -hmm. Well, I think what he was trying to do was leave, himself, leave his own kind of, his own life as, uh, as an example for someone in the future, I suppose. But also, he wants to present his life um, from, a, from a particular perspective, I guess. Um, and you know, what are we trying to get out of it? We're trying to see, I mean, is this a model for us, right? And so I think to a certain extent, that's you know, sort of what he wanted to do. Um, I don't know if he really wanted us to get that much in his head, you know? Uh, and, and sort of to take this humility and um, to look at ourselves in the same, uh, he, he wants us to look at ourselves in the same way, probably, you know? Um, or maybe, maybe that's what we're doing that he didn't want us to. He, he's the example, but you know, we're trying to, to look at ourselves in the same way that he looks at himself. So there's a little bit of a discrepancy, I suppose, but. Um, I think like most yeah. interesting and complex writers, <clears throat> you know, of this kind, right, of this kind who thinks so reflexively, Petrarch is offering up carefully crafted slivers of himself, mm -hmm. right? He's never offering the whole, this is not a true and full confession if there ever is such a thing. Mm -hmm. and. In that respect, it leaves you with a number of possibilities, depending on how you, first of all, just depending on how you respond to it. So of course, the answer to the second half of your question is, what do you think, right? It's probably <laughs> the best, you know, that's the best and most honest answer, is that we're all gonna have different answers to that. Um, what would my answer be? My answer would be, I'm always trying to figure out who they really are anyway. Because then, <laughs> you know, I, I think in that layer between you know, what is presented and what you can discern, subjective as that is, you begin to come to some understanding, which of course is about the meeting of these two minds, your mind and the mind in front of you, right? I mean, that, that for me is one of the fundamental pleasures of reading an interesting mind, you know, which he certainly was. So I suppose, I mean, I, I suspect that every text in this class and the different versions of this class offered through the seminars has been picked to allow you to encounter 
<coughs> an interesting mind who in some way was self-reflexive. And, and to encourage you to sort of think about what is worthwhile in that practice of reflecting, right, on, on education, on learning, mm -hmm. on what it does to you and how it transforms you. Um, I mean, for me, that's, I, I'm a graduate of a liberal arts college. You know, I didn't go to a place like Stanford. I went to Wellesley College. And uh, I have never forgotten, you know, the way in which the entire education there, regardless of discipline, and, you know, this is a, you know, a college that has one of the outstanding economic, undergraduate economics programs in the country. You know, you can take engineering at MIT, as my roommate did. She got a BA in chemical engineering, because um, we only offer BAs. But you know, I, I, never, I never lost that sense that at the center of whatever you did in this interesting place was this kind of liberal arts core, right? You know, to, to, to have that kind of encounter. And I, I think that, I mean, and this is maybe in a way to kind of broaden that out, but I think that's the point of this whole course, right? Is to say that, in, you know, in a larger you know, and, and multivaried university like this, you know, um, we shouldn't define that around any particular set of texts, but in an encounter with an interesting set of texts, one can have these kinds of conversations, and that is really worthwhile, and it's something that long after you have forgotten some particular program that was obsolete at the moment that you were taught it, right? That's how fast things move. If you can buy it, it's obsolete. If you can learn it, it's obsolete, right? Technical knowledge. My husband's a programmer from MIT, so I certainly know from what I speak. Um, I'm also a historian of science and technology, so I have a certain interest in the pace of these changes over time. But this instead is for the long durée, right? You won't know yet at this point which things might be meaningful or which ones will trigger a memory but you know, I, I was just talking with my undergraduate advisor you know, on Skype the other day, because she's halfway around this world this year on sabbatical. And it was triggering certain memories of classes I took you know, in 1982, right? And by now, I've forgotten a lot of things that have happened in 1982, so that was an interesting fact to me, that it made me think of some texts that I had read with her that aren't particularly meaningful to me now, but in some way, talking with her brought it up and made me think about something different than I might have in my ordinary you know, day which was fun. Good reason to Skype people you've known a long time. <laughs> uh, so you mentioned that Petrarch was, is now considered the father of humanism. Um, but nowadays, humanism holds a very different form. Uh, what kind of, what, how do you think that he has created the foundation of humanism as it is now, considered like atheism, focus on the, the achievements of humans, uh, beyond him just choosing his own like, set of books? and maybe breaking away from religion a little bit. So is, is Petrarch the father of kind of a secular humanism, I guess, right? Well, it's, humanism has become something very different, right. mm -hmm. um, but he's still considered the father of it. Um, right. Well, the father of a, kind, a certain kind of like Renaissance humanism, I guess. But I mean, there are some similarities by putting the, sort of the human being at the center of the world and focusing one's attention not on sort of metaphysical superstructures, but on um, uh, metaphysical systems, right? Theological systems. You focus on you know, a, a good life, and you focus on human production as, uh, and human produced knowledge, right? Um, and you know, so you know, is, he the father, is he the father of that? Um, you know, I'm not sure. <laughs> but he's certainly, the, he, he's, He's certainly part of, in a way, sort of extremely important part. He becomes has some, he has symbolic value, I suppose, beyond what what he actually accomplished, because he was very interested in theological questions. You know, so that you know, to to represent Petrarch as you know, a modern, or not, I don't know how to say it, uh, follower of humanism, um, would be a misrepresentation, I suppose, of, of him, right? But yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I agree about that. Uh, my question was more or less uh, sort of along those lines. Um, I was just kind of curious as your thoughts. Um, how do you think uh, Petrarch's religious views or, I guess, interpretations um, played a role in his like reflective approach to life um, and maybe his role as a public intellectual? Okay. You know, I could point out a little bit that you know, his, his representation of himself in the first part of this letter. I mean, he talks about um, you know pride, wrath, um, lust. He talks about his, his his relationship to food, so you know, gluttony, and he's not you know, and um, 
and greed, wealth, right? He's, he doesn't like wealth. So he represents himself through you know, pretty standard representations of sin, right? What is interesting is that he adds on to there, you know, I was, his intellect, he adds on to there his, his studies and, you know, his, the practice of eloquence, of rhetoric, right? So he's sort of, he's, in, he's broadening a kind of religious paradigm for talking about his identity, um, you know, to include other, other things that can, um, I suppose, from a, a medieval point of view, which he really is a medieval man, um, you know, enrich, enrich you spiritually, right? Um, so I think that what he's trying to say is like my study of, of humanity, my study of the past, is just as important as the fact that um, I was not an Epicurean, <laughs> from the, in the kind of, in the wrong sense, non-philosophical sense of the word. But, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's always. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I like the way you put it. That I think David's point about the, the, the expanding of the self-examination, right, of the, the 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 nature of the flaws. I mean, to go beyond a sort of strictly theological view of what needs to be examined about the self is, you know, it, it's 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 it's. I, I wouldn't want to attribute it. It's absolutely uniqueness to him, but I think he does it in a particularly interesting way that begins to open the door for later people, you know, reading across the generations to continue to expand that in whatever they, way they wish as well. Um, and, and out of that comes at a certain point a kind of, I don't know, would Linear say full-blown philosophical self-reflection? I'm not, I, I, I don't want to pretend to be a historian of philosophy because I'm not, and you have an outstanding one <laughs> right in front of you, so I shouldn't even try. <laughs> but, you, but you see the idea. I think that, that there's, you know, the, 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 there's, there's an interesting point in which the naturalness of having a theological perspective at the center of it will begin to be questioned. Okay. Um, and there will be pushback and eventually it can be a choice, you know. And th it can't be a choice for Petrarch. I mean, the theological is absolutely there. You know, mm -hmm. he has to constantly examine those sins too. But, but it's additive, you know, adding on, mm -hmm. yeah. So I want to pick up right there. And um, it does seem that there's a little bit of a, um, or that that this that there is something some truth in the thought that the seeds of this other option are starting to come onto the table here, and I want to try to get at that by inviting you to talk about this other sin that you didn't mention, the sin of pride, mm -hmm. and how the pride how that interacts with the very idea, the very project of self fashioning. So there's some there's some tension that he seems to be struggling with. The aim of the self-fashioning, it seems, has to be at least implicitly to bring about some greater perfection of the self, to put the pieces together in some way that's better than before. Um, maybe even, I mean, you really want to put them together in, in the most perfect artistic way. But, uh, it's really important that you couldn't be perfect without having the piece of your imperfection in there mm -hmm. because otherwise you'd be stuck with the sin of pride. So mm -hmm. I, I guess I want to invite you to reflect on that little paradox and, right. and, um, and whether that points toward a, uh, uh, or whether the very project of self-fashioning the way he um, uh, pursues it um, contains within itself the seeds of this uh, anti-theological uh, version of humanism? Mm -hmm. That's a difficult question. <laughs> um, well, you know, he does say, you know, just, you know, he doesn't have pride. But he's experienced it in others. It's peculiar. <laughs> right. It's a peculiar... It's a, such a prideful thing to say. It's, it, it's interesting. He says, you know, I have felt it in others. And... If the way I read it, you know, it could very well be I felt it against in, in relation to, <laughs> right? The translation is peculiar, um, but um, but it, you know, I think that um, you know, so you're, you're asking us if you know this representation of you know, of himself as a humble person is necessary to sort of to make um, in sort of a lack of pride, right? Um, is contradictory to the act of self-fashioning because it's prideful, 
deeply sinful. Deeply sinful, right. <laughs> uh, is, is against the, so the, that self-fashioning is an act of the, of, of prideful, of a prideful will, right, is what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, and I think that he's, he's aware of that, right? He's aware of the, of the sort of, the slippery line that he's walking. But I think that, you know, the self-awareness of it makes it to where that ambiguity is what he is. Like he is that sort of, he is trying to walk that fine line between a humanist kind of non-theological vision of the world, right? And a Christian, I mean, he's trying to, to bring the two together. And he's, his whole, I guess, the way I see it is the inner being that he represents in, this, in his poetry and a lot of his letters is defined by the anguish that comes out of that inability to, to fully bring them together. Like, how do you do something like that? And I think that you know, that's what makes him so rich for future generations and on numerous levels, right? Because you can take him as a model of the, of the humanist who's you know, trying to reconstruct human culture and you know, propose the old as a model for the new, but you know, he's also kind of the, the, the analysis of, this, of the psyche of that project, right, at the same time. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. I think I you've answered that okay. so well. I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. I don't, I don't know That's that I can add anything really. better than what David yeah. just said. Um, okay, so, like, I'm kind of skeptical that Petrarch was at least truly self fashioned. Because mm -hmm. I feel like there's a clear distinction between being self aware and being, like, self fashioned. So, like, could you first go over that a bit? And secondly, do you feel like the fact that he could not achieve that perfection, that he could not be like St. Augustine, is an admittance of the fact that he's not completely self-fashioned? Or do you think like him admitting that is part of being self-fashioned in itself? Okay. Well, I mean, on that latter point, you know, the, 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 uh, do, is the culmination of self-fashioning a perfect self, right? I mean, that's to take your last point. That's what you're, you know, you're, you're asking. Um, uh, Petrarch would say no for all the reasons that the prior discussion just raised, right? Because that c it's not a presentable self to either to your yourself or to anyone else, right? And that's why he feels other sins of pride. They are not self-realized, not in the psychological sense, but you know, in this in the sense you're talking about. I mean, and and so. You know, so I guess it gets, it gets down to what we mean by self-fashioning. I mean, this is as, I don't know if this has been discussed in the seminars, I mean, the, the, the term self-fashioning is a term that actually became very popular in Renaissance studies when I was a graduate student in the 1980s because there's a famous book written by Stephen Greenblatt who is at Harvard nowadays, um, taught at Berkeley for many years before that, uh, you know, and who recently won for his book, The Swerve, won the National Book Award, the Pulitzer, and non I mean, this is a, if you want to read a best-selling book on the Renaissance, you know, read Steve Greenblatt's The Swerve. <laughs> um, and, and he wrote this book called Renaissance Self-Fashioning, and what it is is all about the malleability and flexibility of the self, of the many ways in which he's using mostly texts from English Renaissance literature, more Shakespeare, texts of that kind, maybe you're reading some of them in one section or another of this class, um, and he's trying to, so, you know, that version of, to pick this book that was just transformative for you know, the field I'm in at a certain moment in time. I mean, that book was all about not a kind of perfection, but really about a flexibility of self mm -hmm. and the way it was expressed in some of the most interesting of English Renaissance literature. Right. Um, and, and the way in which literally people talked more and more about the self, starting with somebody like one of the great humanists of a later generation than Petrarch, but certainly a reader of Petrarch, the Dutch humanist Erasmus, mm -hmm. uh, you know, who literally talks about how the self is fashioned, right? I mean, by then he actually talks about it. He uses those words in Latin, right? They're reasonably translatable from Latin to English. Mm -hmm. So what does that tell us about that particular moment? Mm -hmm. um, so it's, 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 it's not so much a direct answer as a meditation, right, in response to a very interesting question. Yeah. yeah. Um, I wanted to pick up sort of on that and coming back to the question about uh, whether there's a difference between Petrarch's purpose in presenting himself and our thinking about self-fashioning and how we read him. And I think it might be useful to think about the distinction between um, thinking about a life in normative terms. I think most of us are emphasizing that students should ask themselves what sort of life do you want to lead, what sort of person should you be, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but at the same time, um, there's, an, there's an aspect of this process that's about saying what sort of a person 
am I actually? How have I fallen short of my ideals? Mm -hmm. How have I failed? What are the problems and the sufferings that people normally fall into? And it seems to me that part of what makes Petrarch brilliant is that he has both of those projects in suspension in some sense. You can see him imagining the lives he wants to lead and you can see him falling short of the life he wants to lead in a very artful mm -hmm. presentation. But in many ways, I think probably most of our students will need to think in both of those terms about how they want to be, but realistically, how they may be falling short or how other people often do. We just read Marcus Aurelius, and it's very obvious he's very idealistic about how he actually should be, and it's obvious that he's annoyed with everybody every day when he's writing in his <laughs> diary, and that, and that you know he's just not living up to his stoic ideals at all. But so there are both of those two sides for him, for instance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, oh. Hello, yeah. So this kind of follows up on Professor Anderson's question. So in one sense, it seems like uh, Petrarch's kind of relentless pursuit of self-understanding and, and the project of self-fashioning is kind of inspiring. Um, the kind of thing that I think we're drawn to is providing an, an outline for what we're going to be pursuing as uh, developing intellectuals. At the same time, though, and uh, well, this is kind of tragic that the project of uniting the values of his, of his contemporaries and the values of the ancients that he admired so much seemed kind of doomed from the start. And that's the sense in which I think this relates to Professor Anderson's question. So I know this, this is kind of a pessimistic thought and I'm not sure I quite buy it, but um, I'm interested to hear what you say about what, what you have to say about it nevertheless. Didn't Petrarch ultimately fail to fully endorse himself precisely because he dedicated himself so much to studying texts whose values couldn't be reconciled with those of his age? Well, I think if you think about it as a project, right? What does a project do? You know, it's, it's not now, right? It's something that is in becoming, right? And it's not going to be now. So did he fail because he couldn't reconcile these things? No, I don't think so. Um, because a lot of what he envisioned ended up happening eventually, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And, you know, besides the church issue, I mean, sometimes, you know, but the, you know, the Pope came back to Rome and, you know, there was some kind of unification happened eventually, you know, <laughs> with many centuries later. But, you know, he, he became a symbol for that, right? People thought about national unity in terms that Petrarch thought of national unity, right? So, you know, was he successful? And yeah, I think he was. And I think he was successful precisely because he has this introspective turn, right? That he doesn't just have an, an external facade that has nothing behind it. He has an introspective turn. And I think that, you know, we have to read Petrarch, you know, admirably, you know, we should, we should look at him, you know, read his text and see, oh, okay, this is what he's doing. Well, you have a meta reading of it. You know, you have a reading of the text, how it, it can, influence the way we think about ourselves, you know, our learning, the way we want ourselves to be, and you know, the process that he went through to kind of do that. Even if it wasn't successful and, and, you know, and complete, it was, um, it, it was projected into the future, right? And in a certain sense, parts of it have come to be realized. Yeah, yeah I mean, there are these two reasons he writes to the future, and one, of course, is for fame, right, for his ego to continue to exist in some sense, but the other is as an offering, I think, and that's the Petrarch I like better, I mean, in, in, <laughs> and I think we all do, you know, is the, that, that it is a kind of a, a, a gift of what he's learned in the process of trying to learn, mm -hmm. um, and, and that's the Petrarch I like because I think that is something one can take away, you know, there, and, and maybe to go back to, you know, Blair's question, right, about the gap between, you know, the ideal and the real, um, I, I do like him for constantly struggling with that. Mm -hmm. You know, he shares his struggle of the gap between the ideals and the realities of the mid 14th century. Um, perhaps no one better. Right. And and you know, it, it's not our world. You know, the the, the 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 task of any modern reader in reading, whether it's Marcus Aurelius or Petrarch, you know, in the distant past, is to is to time travel back to that. You know moment, you know, that is quite alien, but 
the minds that emerge from these alien moments, you know, still can speak to us, um, some better than others. And that's, I think that's part of that process too, right? Which ones are most helpful in struggling with the inevitable gap between the ideals we all have and the reality? Um, I personally prefer Montaigne. How's that, you know, for, for, for answering my own question <laughs> and Blair's question too. Yeah. Well, I'm glad more? we settled that one. Uh, well, let's give a round of applause to our wonderful speakers. And um, you can project until next week for uh, lunch altogether. So we look, look forward to seeing you then.